That's not how any organization no. I've ever seen works. No. We all just pretend we have this reservoir of free time where yeah. we all go off after meetings and do all our work. We and do. that is called usually bedtime, evening time, not work time. And that's, that is, ugh. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. I'm Rodney Evans and the guy with the fresh to death hair cut is Sam Sperlin. Hey, Rodney. Sorry, for the benefits of our audio-only uh, <laughs> listeners, I was doing a little dance and emphasizing uh, my mustache. You did a little mustache dance Which was there. a it was like visual voguing. component. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go to YouTube. Uh, I, Jack will probably cut that out. Anyway, uh, welcome back to At Work with the Ready. It's Friday afternoon. Sam and I have had long weeks, so we are punchy as hell. But... This is a podcast about modernizing organizations as the future of work meets the present moment. And as you all know, the plan for each episode is that we turn our attention to a common organizational pattern that we think is worth digging into, and then we pull it apart like eighth graders dissecting a frog, Gross. and then we propose solutions for what to do instead. I love, I love that now there's a analogy, metaphor, I don't know the word, mm -hmm. every week it's Something for me to exactly. look forward to. Uh, mm -hmm. This week, we are talking about meetings. Yeah, meetings. It's going to be Hell different yes. than any other time we've ever talked about meetings. I'm super excited. Uh, but first, we're going to check in. Samuel, what say you? Rodney, here's what I say. I say, what are you unreasonably impressed by? And I'm happy to go first. Great. Give me a second. You're just bring this on second. me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I just I just realized one of my answers is going to make it seem like I'm really pumping your tires, uh, and I don't yes. mean it to be like Tell I'm not. Me. I could I use a no win this week, honestly. Reason. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> so I have two slog. <laughs> two things: people who can play musical instruments, like play them really well. I'm always unreasonably impressed by nice. that because I feel like I got a taste of it through my four-ish years of playing the flute yeah. in middle school yeah. and into I first part of high school. So like, I remember what it's like to try to get good at it. And I was okay, but didn't really, you know, commit myself to fluting, as you can tell mm. today. Yeah. Uh, so always impressed by people who can play instruments and anyone who is bilingual or multilingual in any way. I barely speak English and that's it. <laughs> So anybody who can do more than that, I'm always just like God, blown away. I'm so impressed. Says the man who casually dropped orthogonal into last week's introduction. That's that's true. Sometimes sometimes I get a win. Uh, follow up question: Can you play the flute with a mustache? You know that's a good question. Not something I had to worry about in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. um, actually. I kind of did have to worry about it in seventh grade. Uh, early bloomer over here. Um, but I don't think I really let it get to the point that it affected my flute playing. Okay. <laughs> I think the real problematic facial hair for flute playing is probably the goatee. Or like the soul patch. Because this is that's where oh, you Oh, because like, you rest it and it right probably here, you don't right? get the kind of traction. And the mustache, you're just kind of blowing through depending on how long it is. Does it help to have a big chin to sort of rest it on? Help me. I got a pretty, I got like a Jay Leno chin. Help so. me. <laughs> Big ass chin. Okay, this is fun. What was the question? What are you, unre okay. what are you unreasonably impressed by? <laughs> that was a journey. Um, I am truly blown away when I see inside of a restaurant kitchen. Oh, yeah. I'm like, how, how are yeah. they, yeah. like when I watch like, a bunch of chefs like timing a table of 12 multiple courses with really like complicated ink. I'm like, I don't understand. Yeah. I feel like they have to have so many things in their brain to make yeah. the food and then time it correctly. And like, I just... When I am around, I was just in um, Copenhagen and we went to two Michelin starred restaurants and one of them you could like see into the kitchen and um, and it was like silent. It was like a silent kitchen. Oh. It, it, oh. I just was like, I don't Weird. understand how this works. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was wild. Cool. It was wild. It, if I have the option, I will always try to sit where I can 
peer creepily into the kitchen and, and watch. I love a chef's table. It's great. Yeah. Um, if you love us, or even if you hate us, but you listen to this show, please leave us a review. Um, people have been leaving them. Also, people have been like emailing us left, right, and center, and we love it. Yeah. I think I might it's have gotten great. my most favorite ever email that I forwarded to you guys the other day that was like, it was so kind and yeah. it was just like very appreciative. It was just really nice. Anyway, we love getting your emails, but we also love it if you review us. Um, and <laughs> Jack specifically wanted me to tell you guys that he's not slacking off. He would like you to follow us on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Instagram. Um, people, the nerds are finding us on Instagram and commenting on stuff. There are stories. Uh, right. It's really fun. So uh, go follow us or tell other people to um, maybe like somebody who hates their meetings, uh, point them to this show when it gets released. Rodney, what the hell are we talking about today? I'm going to tell you what we're talking about today. Please do. Well, I'm going to take the first the first crack at it and then Great. you're going to put a, a put a finer point on it. So you already said we're talking about meetings, which okay. is true. But for the real at the ready or at work with the ready heads out there, you know we've talked about meetings. We've talked about one-on-ones. We've talked about OS coffees. We've talked about retros. Yum. We've talked about action meetings, which is unequivocally agreed to be the best episode of this podcast prior oh to God. me joining as a it's co-host. Exhausting. And we've talked about operating rhythms broadly. So how could we possibly talk about meetings more? Great question. And yet, and yet... We're going to, because I don't think we've really just talk, talked about meetings as a phenomenon. We have mm. talked about different flavors of meetings and meetings in the context of an operating rhythm, but I think there is more to just meetings in general that we should dig into a, a little bit more today. So what, do you, what do you think about that and what, uh, what sort of flavor do you want to throw on that? I think that when you pitched this, I was so tired that I would have said yes to anything and... <laughs> I love talking about meetings, and given that it's a Friday afternoon on the back of three weeks of travel, I feel like being in our sweet spot is not a bad idea for us right now. So Totally. It doesn't this, matter because we're both stoked to talk about it. We're, we're here. We're psyched. Uh, my <laughs> yeah. memory is not um, functioning at full capacity right now. Mine is, and it's still horrible. Gr- so. <laughs> Between <laughs> us, we make up one person, one adult person's proper short-term memory. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think the pattern is that meetings are too often very expensive band-aids for missing practices in the OS or missing clarity in the OS. And because they are weighty and they're expensive and they're sort of vaunted, they tend to actually breed more, not fewer meetings, because they are held up as the solution to a lot of different kinds of problems. But then we get in a loop where the meeting is meant to solve a problem that is actually caused by the meetings. And off we go Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. mediocrity. Mm -hmm. Ta-da! Meeting-ocrity. (gasps) Meeting-ocrity. Look at him. Episode title. Look at him go. (laughs) Okay, I love it. So, um, so why don't you yeah. kick us off here with? Uh, I'm going to throw take on you this. a curveball right off the bat uh, because great. of everything we've already said. I'm going to come in hot. Meetings are great. Meetings <laughs> can be great. Agreed. I think when I think of my peak moments with clients and at work generally, almost always it was it happened in some kind of meeting. So I actually wanted to set the stage coming in pretty positive about like, it's important to get this right because they're actually super duper important. Yeah. Does that feel controversial to you or no? No. Okay, good. And in fact, I think that part of why I find this pattern so frustrating is because it devalues how great meetings can be because so many of them are so trash. And it's like, I totally agree with you. I just think that like good meetings live with the reputation of all of the shitty meetings, which is most of them. Yeah. Okay, cool. So maybe that wasn't as hot of a take as I thought, but I just wanted to say that up front because it's it's easy. And I've heard lots of podcasts like this, lots of read lots of articles like this. It's easy to come in 
and like just smack meetings around and be like, no, these are horrible. Yeah. Like, totally. why do we have them as an organization? Um, so I don't want to. I don't want to say that. I do, however, think there are all sorts of things going on that that are tied to that pattern. So let's just kind of nail some of them here. So first, the first thing that I thought of when I was thinking about meetings is that they've always been kind of bad in mm-hmm. many cases, mm-hmm. but it got ramped up big time as part of the pandemic. Yeah. I think I think in per, bad in-person meetings, at least if there are people in the meeting who you like enjoy or have somewhat positive relationships with, like being in a shared space with them, even in a bad meeting, is not that bad. But being in that same meeting where everybody is virtual and nobody actually really wants to be there, you no longer have that potential connection of like walking out the room together with someone and like having a quick chat or even just like, you can't even do the knowing uh, side eye look anymore in fully virtual meetings, which I feel like, I feel like, novels of information were passed through glances totally. and looks in meetings totally. that is just totally gone in in zoom now totally have you have you felt that way yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. i was just um where was i i was just somewhere who with uh people who i had not met in person before god it's really escaping me where this was i i was i was wildly surprised by how different they were in person than uh, my yeah. perception of them. Yeah. And what's the statistic? Like you are missing, I don't know, like 80% of information about it's a some, communication. Some it's some absurdly really high, high number. Yeah. It's really uh, high. But I, I, can, I can feel it. You know, as we're doing more and more stuff in person again, I'm realizing, I really put, when I have the facilitator hat on and there's a co-facilitator in the room who I know, yeah. like – we can just looking at each other and like little head like we can have a whole we can plan out the next section just from from that and yeah. have not figured out a way to do that uh, on Zoom yet. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Zoom makes all of this harder, but yeah. is not a that uh, doesn't have to be a thing that gets in the way of of having a better a better meeting culture. But let's hit a couple other. Uh, descriptions of the essential thing. And I know this is something I've said before, but not everybody hears every episode and I like saying things uh, more than once. So my take on meetings is that they are the lowest common denominator visible way to move work forward. Mm. Like you, If you don't know what to do next with something at work, pulling together people into a meeting will... N- in most cultures, nobody's going to look at you askance. It's like the normal thing to do. Um, so sometimes that is the right move. Great. Let's do it. Let's be thoughtful. Let's make sure the right people are there. We have the right structure for the conversation that we're going to have. And m- too frequently, none of those things happen. And suddenly we're just in a room with some people and you're either wondering why you're there you are wondering why somebody else isn't there. Yeah. And the first you know, 15 minutes is like, all right, let's get ramped up on the last time that we met on this thing, Ugh, which may have worst. been three months ago or last week or literally I yesterday. It. Yeah, I hate it. I feel like, um, I don't exactly know why this is my reaction to that, but like, I feel like that kind of meeting, that kind of lowest common denominator meeting works. I, I think I tend to do that thing most at the very beginning of something when it feels Mm. like we need to swim in it together to create enough momentum to go. Right. And then, and this is separate from like operating rhythm. I'm talking about sort of the kind of like meeting that's just like, we need to move work forward. I find that sort of more, more ephemeral, less structured meeting at the beginning when it's just like, we need to like get gin up some energy. And then also when things really are stuck, I think to just be like, I feel like a lot of times when something is stuck in a complex project or problem or program, it's quite difficult to figure out what the fuck is going on. And I feel like sometimes that is a moment to just be like, yeah, we're just going to get in a room and like dig into this because I cannot make sense of what is going on here. Totally. And and that what you just described there is so much more thoughtful than a lot of these the, the equivalent that I have seen in in other organizations, because when you have called people together to figure out why we're why we're stuck, yeah. 
like I can picture you facilitating that already. And that's a productive conversation. I think a lot of groups, a lot of teams come together for that same reason, but nobody has articulated that. And it's just like, this is the time that we work on the thing. And we have no... We have no muscle built around the idea of working on the thing outside of the meeting itself. So this is just the way that we structure our days is we have meetings for the things that we are working on. And you know which thing to be working on based on which meeting that you are in. Yeah. And that, I think, can be done deliberately and very frequently is not. And that's where the crushing comments around meetings come from in many cases and you know what's funny i feel like so many me i mean we shit on status meetings all the time understandably uh but i feel like status meetings are meant to be about i mean theoretically they're about information sharing but actually they're about accountability status meetings are meant to be like do you have your shit together uh come to this public forum and prove it and prove prove <laughs> and yourself prove, prove it and then also but then what's funny is that i feel like most status meetings are so performative that they neither do the real information sharing no nor status. the accountability because like yeah. because they become you know so many status meetings become an explanation of like what i'm going to do next because i didn't actually do it before this and so it's like there's neither real information shared nor real accountability and and then as both the receiver of the information or lack thereof in that meeting you're like well what a waste of time and as the provider and i used to be one of these people as the provider of a non-status or like the person who basically prepares to not get in trouble in the meeting because the thing isn't done they're just they're just an exercise that you want to get over with you're just like how do i like like shape shift enough in this meeting to not look like a butthead and, and like, right. and basically just like kick the can for another week to yeah. give me enough time to do whatever I didn't get done for today. Totally. And that's such a indicator that obviously something is, is broken because, yeah. you know, I try not to hold up the ready as any sort of like beacon of doing everything right. We have our own challenges. But one of the things that I think we do really well is that when I have an internal meeting to that I've been invited to or that I've organized, I look at it on my calendar and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Because like this is like, okay, I know like I have this open loop. I have this thing that I feel responsible for. I need input. I need advice. And we have a place where that is going to happen. And I can trust that the people who are going to show up to it are going to be prepared. They're going to understand why they're there. They're going to understand how to contribute. And it just becomes a place where I get to go make progress on something that I really care about. Or I get to contribute to something that I care about, even if I'm not personally holding it forward. Yeah. And like that's what I want to bring to our clients as as much as possible. And that's the like transcendent version of not even transcendent. That's like just like the the productive good feeling just the version, good version of a meeting. The transcendent ones are like way out there. Like you rarely get those, but every once in a while it's like a, you know. I was going to say church experience, but I'm not a particularly religious man. I was, so a lot I of don't. Transcendence in churches. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a game seven Stanley Cup sort of experience. I don't know what any of that into means. Into my own language. Um, it's funny because I feel like internal meetings, as an example, part of the reason that they I think tend to be so good, and we could talk about tactics, but. First of all, I think the people that host them do have the feeling of wanting to make them quite valuable and not wanting to waste anyone's time and understanding that meetings should be like precious and not a sort of solution for everything. And I also think we have enough flexibility and enough honesty that it's like if something isn't done and the point of the meeting is to discuss it people will just say let's not do this like i'm not ready to have this or like i hosted a meeting this morning that was about like generating a bunch of input around the ready strategy and my initial intent had actually been to do most of the facilitation myself and then because of my travel schedule etc like i prioritized last weekend doing a lot of research and writing in preparation for it. 
and then asked other people to do a lot of the facilitation. And it's like, I think in a lot of cases, meetings feel quite fixed. And it's like, this is the agenda. This is who holds it. So you just fill up the time because everybody's going to be there with an expectation that like it's Tuesday. So it's status meeting day. So everybody bring your status. And they don't flex to like, well, I didn't actually finish that thing or I didn't have time to do the prep I wanted to or I changed my mind about how this thing was going to go. Like there's not a lot of like um, lightness or lightly heldness in a lot of corporate meetings. And I think that's part of why they end up being not very good is because the people who are hosting them don't feel sort of the freedom to be like based on based on what's actually happened, what would make a really great meeting now, including no yeah. meeting. Yeah, so, so true. And I love that you keep using the word host, which I think you're deliberately doing because we do think of the, it's not just the person who sent the calendar invite, right? right? Like you are welcoming people to the meeting, setting the context for what we are here to do and kind of making sure that we have done what we need to do to to be able to use this time together really well. And I don't necessarily see that as a role that uh, just exists by default in a lot of other um, cultures. Yeah. And I think that like, it's, um, if you think about hosting and facilitating as two roles in any meeting and, and, taking those both quite seriously. It's like, I sort of think if I am the meeting host and I ask for facilitation help, ultimately, I still feel responsible for the experience that people have. And I assume that the facilitators, if they need help or ideas or inspiration or whatever, will ask me as the host for that. And when I'm facilitating someone else's meeting, I feel like I am there to like get the outcomes that the person convening that meeting, whether it's a client or it's you, I'm there to get the outcomes that the person convening the meeting intends for it to meet. Totally. And the other thing that I was going to point out about what you said there is that I'm realizing that we actually have two sort of conceptualizations of Um, of meetings within the ready and and how we talk about them with clients on the one hand and you can see this through the episodes that we've already done which are about specific meeting types with specific meeting structures designed for specific meeting purposes so on that hand on, on that that side of it it's very structured and very deliberate and there's like a play that we are running here yeah and on the other hand it is the holding lightly of it where maybe we don't necessarily need structure or the structure we need is no structure. And because we have a facilitator, we have somebody who has thought about what do we actually need from this, we can trust them to kind of design along the way and know that we will also get to to where we need to go. And I think knowing when to use either of those and having the skills and the capabilities to do either end of those is is great. And I wonder if the messy middle is actually what we're trying to avoid in many places. Mm. Interesting. And if you had to just describe the messy middle in brief, what would you call it? How would you say it? I mean, I think it's it's like the the uh, show up. There's an agenda that uh, that we maybe use every week that the leader has changed a couple of times. So we have structure in that the leader is running it, and we have an agenda that is kind of not really reflective of what the group really needs in, in the moment. Uh, so we feel beholden to sticking to the agenda, yet the agenda does not actually represent the important information. So we're structure, there's no lightness, there's no kind of responding to what's happening in the room. That's, I think, what comes to mind for that. Yeah, that's cool. Well, and it's like, you know, just like everything else we talked about with the racy, like meetings also fall into the different sort of like zones of the ocean that we described. And it's like a meeting agenda can be very sunshine zony. It's like we wrote down the things that we do every single week. And then like the how of that gets lost. So it's like if every week there's these kinds of updates, does anyone think about like, well, maybe something better than an update would be a demo or maybe something better would be like, um, everyone trying out the new tool asset, whatever, at 
live or maybe like I you know I used to host like a crit like an art style crit like to to give feedback on work in progress or maybe a, an advice process around the update like it like the the sunshine zone version is here are the segments of the meeting that sit in the repeating calendar invite but then nobody sweats the actual like but what the fuck happens in the room whether it's virtual or in person and I think that's where that's like where it gets interesting and that's where it gets where, yeah. where you have an ability to be more responsive and um and, and also like you have an ability to design for some spontaneity and like for some yeah. kismet and like you know you said some of the best moments that you've had at work have been in meetings and I feel the same way and it's like when inspiration strikes, you don't have to just go like, well, it's time for all other business. You can just sort of like follow the energy if mm -hmm. the magic is happening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think all of that requires a, a pretty nuanced understanding of, of the work, which I feel like as I'm hearing myself say that, it's it almost doesn't make sense. But I feel like there is something... Some, hopefully useful here, which is the work is not the getting through the meeting. The, the yeah. work is not like we got through the meeting and nobody cried, which is honestly a win in some places. Uh, the work is perhaps if you really understand the work and you pull the people together for the meeting and you do it in 15 minutes, like, holy cow, great. Let's move on with our day. But I think I think a lot of times when we're in these kind of, I guess, meetings by default, if if we had to define how do we know when we're done with this meeting, I don't think many people would be able to come up with something other than it's the top of the hour and it's totally. time for my next meeting. That's and a really that, good point. And that like starting to get better about what is like what is winning this meeting today look like? Yeah. And can we get there before we run out and instead of treating the the end point of the meeting on the calendar invite as our like uh, the, the bell that releases us to go to our next class. Yeah, it's like the it's the safety net that at the very least we know we'll leave at the end of the hour. But nobody expects to be here until then because we have a thing that we're trying to do and maybe we can do it in 40 minutes. I love that. And yeah, I love that. I also feel like a lot of meetings are intentionally. I don't want to use the word designed because no one's thought about their design, but they are by default meant to avoid controversy or conflict yeah. or surprise. Like I used to attend a meeting weekly and um, I remember my boss telling me I was like representing my team in this meeting. And I remember my boss telling me it, it is very important that no one in that meeting is surprised by anything right. that you bring. And it's yeah. like, well, why are we having a meeting then? Like, why are we here then? Why do I have to bring the information if if what I meant to do is tell them all about it before I go there? Then why do I have to go there? Like, I could just yeah. send them all one on one emails with the information so that they had totally. time to process it quietly. I, it was so weird. It was so weird to me, but I think that's actually quite typical. Like, I don't, I don't, I think like no surprises in meetings. That's the worst. Like, that's the worst <laughs> yeah. way to have a meeting. All, yeah. all I want to be is surprised, mostly delighted, yeah. but maybe even so surprised by bad stuff. Like, because yeah. meetings are, they are so expensive and they do take so much of our energy, it's like, why wouldn't we want that to be the place where the spiciest, the weightiest, the most yeah. essential things happen, even if they happen without us knowing they're going to? Yeah. And, and I'm, I agree with you and I am thinking about, well, what is it about, you know, the fact that I feel okay about what you just said there. And it's that in general, psychological safety in meetings that I'm in at the ready where spicy things might come up is quite high. It's pretty high. And yeah. I, and I trust that people aren't going to fly off the handle and that we can have a conversation where we do have slightly different, and I'm talking about only slightly different takes on like how we should do things. And that can feel like a bridge way too far in a lot of uh, our clients' environments, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You got to get them lined up before you get in the room.
And I feel well, like there and, was and, a time at yeah. the ready when there were more people who would just like totally. toss a grenade on the table and it sucked. Yeah. Because yeah, then it felt exactly. like it became everyone else's like responsibility to care for the person who was like having a freak out. And that was super yeah. whack too. So like I I hear you. I think it's just like, I don't know. I'm trying to get to something that feels like kismet without emotional uh, danger. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, totally hear you on that. As I'm sitting here and thinking though about kind of what – what paradigm, what assumptions we're making about meetings here that um, are maybe not shared by everybody who is showing up to probably meetings. Most, it makes most me everything we've said, probably. <laughs> well, it makes me think about, we're, we're coming for, at this from like a very rational kind mm. of objective point of view. We're here to do a thing. What's the thing? Can we do it faster? That sort of, of, of stuff. But I do think there are people who view, particularly people in um, positions of power, who don't really care about any of that. What they care about is that this meeting for this hour is their little arena for performative power, yeah. for performative domination of their colleagues. Yeah, uh, and that's not, you know, coming at coming at that meeting from a well. What do we just need to get done? If the person in charge of it is like, I don't care. I just like being in charge for an hour and yeah. telling people what to do and yeah. having my little my little kingdom for a little bit. That's like a, a very different paradigm to to have to deal with. Yeah, it is. And if if the dynamic of a meeting feels performative, and like what we mean by that is that one or a couple of people are there to like do the talking, assert their opinion, control the discourse, then naturally that means everyone else who is there is an audience member. And so yeah. if if every week we're just going to go and like watch a show in the barn, boo. Like first of all, record that uh, <laughs> so that I can watch it while I like do my stupid exercises. And second of all, it's just like, when leaders say to us all the time, like, I want participation and I want to hear people's opinions. And then they hold meetings like that. I'm like, you are showing a movie and these people are coming with popcorn. Why would you expect them to yell at the screen? Like you have, yeah. you have created a dynamic <laughs> where you are very clear on what you want people to do. And what you want them to do is eat popcorn and at the end be like, <laughs> and then the lights come up and they go to their next thing. So yeah, I think it's such a it's such an interesting dynamic. And you and I have talked about this before on this show. I also think meetings like writing email is one of the most satisfying but also soul crushing aspects of fake work. Where you're just yep. like, I sure did uh I sure did sit and stuff today. I sure did sit today. Yeah. I yeah. sure did sit and listen to people talk today. And at the end of the day, you're like exhausted from not actually like actively doing anything or participating in anything, just but just being places. Yeah. That to me feels like the most soul crushing, burnout yeah. inducing way of spending a day that I can literally imagine. Totally. And I had do I have such empathy for folks who feel like, look. I have to be at this meeting because even if I don't talk, because if I'm not here, I won't hear about important stuff that I need to do or need to hear about for my job. Or, yeah. you know, our culture is such that even though I never speak in this meeting, if I stopped going to it, I'm going to get a nasty gram from well, my that, boss or yeah, my boss's yeah. boss or something like, like they that. Are, they are putting on that show and they do expect you to be there yeah. with the popcorn. and. Totally. And we're and we're going to get into like well, what to do instead. And I do think that this whole domain of org design has a lot of surface area for individual action and individual mm. experimentation and yeah. individual commitment to doing things differently. And like with everything, individual efforts on making meetings better is never going to be sufficient in and of itself. No, absolutely not. That's absolutely true. Um, another thing that I want to talk about is the like hall monitor meeting nerd vibe thing that happens because I was having a conversation with someone actually at the ready recently about default practices in ready teams and that if I have one um, sort of like paranoia it's that we don't always practice what we preach with clients and that there are just there totally. are things that we know just 
fucking work. Like retros just work. Don't not do retros. Like just come on, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that sometimes we negotiate away from them or think we're too smart for the practices that slap every time, et cetera. And the person I was talking to very, I thought very wisely was like, when you're not the steward or like in real life in out in the world, like the leader, it can feel awkward and sort of like nerdy to be the one who goes like, um, actually, I think it's we should really have a retrospective and stay on schedule with and like TikTok facilitate structure. And I really felt that I was just yeah. like. It's, e- it's a lot easier with clients to go like, y'all, today is time for our strategy meeting. We're not going to do whatever this nonsense is. Like, no, it's, yeah. we got to do the thing because you want it. And if we don't do it, you won't have it. It's a, yeah. I think it is hard. And you're paying internal. us. To, and you're to paying do this. me to, <laughs> you're literally paying me to keep you accountable to the thing you said you wanted. Yeah. So it's a lot easier to be in that role. I understand actually how internally it might be difficult to go like, I just don't really feel like we have role clarity and I think we really need to charter. Like, I feel like we're missing a working agreement here and we really need to do it. Or like, we really haven't retrospected in a quarter and I kind of am feeling that. I think it's, I think it's tricky. Yeah, I, 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 I'm trying to empathize because I feel like I love being that person. Um, Do you? I don't do I I think I, I, I think I maybe not I, I mean I've definitely been on teams comfortable being that person it doesn't yeah, seem again, uncomfortable to you but I have definitely been a part of teams I actually today Zamari and I we had a retro and I almost because I'm way too busy than I than I should be and that's not an excuse but it's reality I almost suggested that we bailed and we did I didn't suggest it but I did suggest can we just talk and not make a board? We only had half an hour. Sam, how dare. And you know what? It was great. It was it was absolutely great. 30 minutes making a board and stuff. Ah, we don't need that. Yeah. Let's get some, it was just the two of us. Let's but like let's have a retro. It. We did it and we talked about it and we had good stuff to to talk about. And it wasn't even that either one of us had like tensions that we had to talk about. Yeah. But through just talking about how the work has been going, we were able to like give each other a little bit of feedback and and identify a couple of things that had come up and and like pump each other's tires about great work that we've been doing. We left that meeting like with like a rosy glow, um, and we wouldn't have had that if we had bailed if we had bailed on it. Yeah, I feel like meetings are like therapy, like that, where it's like you. I don't know. I mean, anyone who's been in therapy, I'm sure, or coaching. Uh, feels very compelled to cancel those sessions regularly. And you know that when you go, it's going to be valuable. Like, even if you don't have a thing that feels pressing, uh, just showing up to that container is going to be valuable. And I think part of the reason that you are more comfortable with that is I do just see you as someone who puts a lot of stock in good habits. And everybody should. Thank you. Everybody should Thank put you. stock in good habits. But I don't think people do because in the in the present moment when they don't feel like it, it's very easy to just go like, do we really need this habit anyway? Or like, I'll hit it next time. And I think you're just a person who, for I'm sure because of a lot of your own work that you've done, just has a tendency to not give in to the momentary desire to be undisciplined. I that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. She's, and you know I'm so nice to you. The people who I mean, listen to this show are gonna think I'm a monster. No, I I let me rephrase. That is among other things, there one of the nicest things you ever said to me. And you know, there's a whole there's a whole episode probably around um and I actually wrote, talked about it in our in our strategy meeting today, that there is transformation is a word that has brings up images of big moves with mm. big results. Yeah. And the most productive, successful projects that I have been a part of do often end up with something that at the end, in retrospect, can feel transformational. But in the moment, it's just doing small things a little bit better very consistently. Yeah. It's 
the stuff that we're talking about, it's it's not like these big hero moments where we came together and spent three hours and like figured everything out. It's like, yeah, at our, at our weekly action meeting, we always do the habit review. And when, th- when something is popping up weird in that we talk about it and we get better at it and we yeah. make sure it's always something up to date. Um, it's so much of that stuff just over and over and over. It had, the end result is just a better OS and yeah. that doesn't feel transformational when you're in it. Uh, but it can be in, in retrospect later on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, I think it's one of the hardest things about the work that we do is that the principles are quite lofty and the end state is quite inspiring. And the way that you get there can feel quite like pedantic and a little bit, yeah. uh, yeah. yeah, a little bit bland. It can feel a little bit like good ops. It can feel yeah. like hygiene. Like, it's just like yeah. time to do the check in. And it's like, I know, I know nobody, wa- I know you guys just want to skip the check in round and get right to it. But it's like, yeah. we do check in rounds because over time and reps, we end up with this very nuanced, very textured image and understanding of our colleagues that we have no other way of accessing except to do this thing over and over and over again for years. Like, yeah. And I know that in the moment when it's like, what's your favorite season? People are like, please <laughs> shut your mouth. But, yeah. Rosie, no, you have to be quiet if you're going to stay. Uh, but over time, it just, it adds up to magic. So I'm yeah, I'm with you. Agreed. And also a lot of people based on power dynamics, based on identities, based on their own lived experience, have a really hard time being the narc. That's like, we got to do the habit and so I just want to say out loud that uh, yeah. I understand that. And to the extent that you can, please try to do it anyway. All right, Ronnie, before we get into our usual section of sharing what we think works better instead, uh, let's share some ideas from our partners at Slack on how you can run better meetings using Slack's huddle feature. Yeah, I like huddles. Do you use huddles? I love huddles. Yeah. I love them too, because huddles are right there. They're a really lightweight way to communicate. They're audio first. You just pop it open and you're in there. You don't have to go get a link from a different kind of software and then put it into Slack. It's already there. You can use them inside of a Slack channel or inside of a DM or through like a Slack connect, like a shared channel with an external partner, which I do a lot of because it saves you sort of the calendar back and forth of like, when could we find a time? I can't see my clients' calendars often, so it can be a lot. It's like it's like just calling someone. It can be a lot easier to just go like, here you go. Do you have a sec? And then you're just in it. And I feel like they go faster than when you actually like schedule a meeting in a different one hundred percent. And I and I I'm I think in my old age I am becoming more intolerant of having to jump around to like lots of different tools to Mm. do basically engage in like different modalities for the same project. Like I don't want to have to, if I'm talking to you in Slack and we decide, Hey, let's have a chat. I don't want to have to go somewhere else to go have that chat and then come back and look at what we were writing. Like why can't it all just be literally in the same spot? That's what a Slack huddle is. And that is why it is. I, I am a big fan. Yeah. And if you think about just the sort of behavioral economics side of this, like in terms of nudging and taking friction out, the fact that they, you don't have to change an app or send an invite or like wait for the software update or whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, I think that for companies who want to encourage their uh, team members to actually just hop into a synchronous conversation when it's needed, you're really yeah. taking a lot of the friction out of that by just like getting into a huddle, even by even just the name of it. It's like, it's not a meeting. It's just a huddle. It's meant to just be yeah. as long as it needs to be, not be uh, forever or permanent. And the nice thing about that, you might assume that, oh, well, this is like the thing that's built into Slack. It's just called a huddle. It's probably missing like a bunch of the features that we would need in a uh, that we would use with a different tool. No. We got no. screen sharing, yeah. which it, we need that. You got live captioning. You've got the ability for anyone in the channel to join and leave as needed. I don't need to go send you an invitation. If you're in the channel, you can see the huddle. Just get in here. Just get in it. It's 
it's got the features that you want to be able to use in a video chat. So it's not like you feel you, you don't have to give up some of the nice uh, bonus stuff yeah. to use Huddle. Like it's it's all it's all right there. Can I tell you my favorite thing real quick I about tell about you my Huddles? Favorite thing. You can go first. Okay. Okay. So we obviously use Slack at the ready, and no. there are lots of different channels <laughs> that I am a, a member of. And I love if it's a public channel, you can see when there is a huddle happening in that channel mm. because we have channels where if people are huddled up, like non-client channels, where it's just like if people are huddled up in random, fun stuff is happening. Yeah, there. you're going, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna, gonna go jump in. in there and see what's up. I've hosted co-working sessions at the ready where I'm like, hey, if you're in this channel and we're we're in a huddle, just come join. We're going to do some quiet co-working. We'll just like be in each other's presence. It's really cool to see across your organization when huddles are happening in various places. I love that, dude. And like the other day, I was in a meeting with a couple of co-workers and like and an external person. And then we got out of that meeting and they wanted to debrief and someone like went and got a link and put it into Slack, et cetera. And I was I like went to do the next thing. And so I missed it. And if I had seen mm. that they were in a huddle in that channel, I would have known that we were doing a little hot wash and I would have just hopped in. But um, I missed 20 minutes of the post conversation because I didn't check. So That's huddles are dope in this way. They have like multi-person screen sharing. You can draw, you can um, drop links. And it's cool because those things then are um, captured persistently in Slack. So you don't have to then go find them the way that you do if you use a different kind of tool and you're sharing links in a chat. Like this way, it is all in the place that you are working anyway, um, which just, it just speeds things up. It just makes things easier. It's less org daddy to not be porting things between different tools um, that are both asynchronous and synchronous comms. So the next time you're going to have any kind of meeting, make it a huddle. It's fast. It's easy. Let's you focus on what really matters, your work. Click the link in the show notes or visit slack.com to learn more. So Sam, what yes. other ideas you got for making meetings better? Ooh, I got all sorts of ideas. Too many to do in just this this one episode, but I will start with what I said earlier about meetings being a place that is super ripe for individual ownership, individual experimentation, kind of individual attempts at making things better. So here are some ideas that I don't know. I feel like a dweeb now t- talking about some of these, but nice. I'm just going to lean into We've my dweeb. We've established that dweebiness. that's your thing, though. Yeah. So here is um, a fun little experiment, uh, depending if you have a brain like mine. Uh, for a week, try joining every meeting with full intention and attention on on that meeting itself. So if it's virtual, mm. it's close your email inbox, it's mm. close Slack, it's full screen the video chat, maybe take notes Ooh. on a piece of paper on your desk. It's like, just try that experience and see what comes up for you. It's probably not sustainable because if you're in one of these uh, organizations where meetings are just what you do all day long, you're also multitasking in preparation for your next meeting. Totally. However, if you can try this experiment of truly bringing your attention onto the meeting that you are participating in, I, when I have done that in the past, I have found ways to engage in that meeting mm. that I would not have otherwise. Mm. Like if the option is to lean in and say something that might be uncomfortable or offer to facilitate or stay on mute with my video camera off and read a website or yeah. check my email, it's really going to have to rise to a level of like, I can't ignore this feeling in order for me to step into it. Yeah. And if you don't have the option of the other thing, I think your kind of um, activation energy is much lower. You're like, mm-hmm. I got to be here fully focused anyway. Right. I'm not going to sit through this garbage. Let me, I'm going to contribute something here. Or we need a facilitator. I'll do it. And um yeah, I don't know. This is something about about playing with your own attention um, in the realm of meetings that I think is interesting and may give you some 
new insights worth following down the road. I love that. I feel like every time I take a vacation, when I come home, I'm like, I am only going to monotask at work from this day yeah. forward. And it does usually last for a couple of weeks, and then I start to get distracted. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why I think it's good to conceptualize it as an experiment. I'm not saying like, decide from here on out. I am right. only focusing on... Try it for a week. Like, do it for... If a week seems well, do it for a day. Yeah. Heck, do it for just your next meeting. That's the only commitment. And see if that's possible and see what that brings up for you. I love that. That's so good. All right, what do you got? I want people to try doing work in meetings. It feels so weird. People don't like it. Okay, so first of all, this is where I don't somewhere today in this conversation, and Zoe said this in the strategy conversation this morning. She was like, work has lost all meaning. People don't even know what work means. It's just like a it's just a shell. It's just been like sold for parts, you know? And it's so awkward now and so um unusual for people to gather and make something together at yeah. in like a you know knowledgey kind of job which is such a shame because yeah. i love going to a meeting where someone is bringing work in progress and where the structure of the meeting is read this work in progress or um or see, look at this work in progress and then like hands on keyboards make it better or question it or leave your reactions to it or like add your sticky notes or like I love a meeting where we break out of the um the tennis of like call and response performer audience thing and we're all in real work together um, I yeah. just think that that is incredibly effective. It's incredibly unusual. Our clients get super jittery about doing work in meetings because um, I think there's yeah. a level of like vulnerability, but it busts up yeah. perfectionist tendencies and performative tendencies and frankly, just like tremendous time sucks preparing and polishing shit for each other's consumption. Um, and I just think it's really cool and it's a really good way to actually make progress on stuff and not just have the meeting be a place where work gets kicked off that then must be done somewhere else right. in private. Yeah. And if we, if, if organizations actually worked that way where, you know what, we only have two meetings a day and we define the work in the meetings and then we all go off to do our deep work to figure out, like to actually move work forward. Yeah, sure. Okay, fine. Like define the work in meetings. That's not how any organization no. I've ever seen works. No. We all just pretend we have this reservoir free time where yeah. we all go off after meetings and do all our work. We and do. that is called usually bedtime, evening time. <laughs> not work time. And that's, that is, uh, yeah, I love this. I, if you look at my calendar, you'll see, um, the abbreviation I use for these meetings, uh, MST, make stuff time. Make stuff time. Uh, and I have it, I have it with clients and I have it with project teams. Um, and yeah, it's lightly structured. Generally, it, it actually, it totally depends on what we're going to be jamming on together. Sometimes it is, we'll spend the whole time in a document working on it together. Sometimes it's like, Hey, you're going to work on this. Cool. I'm going to work on this. We're both going to be on mute and we're going to have some music playing and we're going to check back in at the bottom of the hour and like give each other feedback on the yeah. thing that we were working on. Yeah. There's lots of ways to do this, but yeah, doing, doing work during meetings is um, a radical, but simple idea. It's the best of co-working virtually. And yeah. I often find that make stuff time is where I will put the things that I know are important but not urgent. Like it's where it's like, oh, they're re you know, how many times in a week do we say that should be an article? That should be a what or like this client needs a toolkit or that we need to make a playbook. And make stuff time is where I like pin that to be like, no, this is this is when the toolkit gets made. This is when the article gets drafted. Yeah. This is when the articles get read. Sometimes during make stuff time, it's like I am going to actually finally read this thing and write my thoughts down about it. Like it's just yeah. nice to have a container for all of the stuff that doesn't fit tidily into our day otherwise. It's just yeah. also a higher cool. likelihood it's going to get done. What else you got? All right. Um, we've got a whole panoply of ideas here. I'm just going to oh, pick panoply. one. 
Yes, a panoply. Um, all right, so one of the most common tensions we hear about meetings is just there's like I don't want to be there, but I have to in order to be aware of what is happening. So yeah. I think there is an, an opportunity, especially to maybe leverage AI to level up our transparency and sharing of what happens in a meeting. Because mm -hmm. I fully believe there are meetings where there are conversations that are going to be happen that are that are going to happen that affect me or would be helpful for me to be aware of, but I should not spend an hour listening for that 15 minutes yeah. or for that 10 minutes that might be relevant to yeah. me. So why can't we, and I'm, why, I'm, not, I'm not saying like publish transcriptions, although that may not be a bad idea, but these AI tools now are good at summarizing meetings. Like I have had, I have pretty consistently looked at the summarizations that the AI has created after a lot of my meetings. And with 90 seconds of fixing a few things it is good. good enough to share with people who might be who might care about what happened in yeah. that meeting so if we could lean into that a little more experiment with that are there meetings that currently have 30 people in them that could get down to 15 and 15 other people read the ai summary at the end get it. probably yeah for sure i love that i think that's really good and also even if i don't know I'm a person in my role who like just has a lot of context switching that makes yeah. it hard to remember the details of all of the things. I look back at AI summaries all the time just to be like, what was that thing he said? Yeah. It's nice. I like it. We should use it. Cool. Um, okay. My all last right. one is so easy. Oh, I love easy ones. We love an easy win. So as Sam said at the top of this now uh, infinitely long podcast episode, we have done other episodes about specific structures like governance meetings, action meetings, retrospective meetings, strategy meetings. The op rhythm episode covers a lot of this ground. If you are in the trad meeting routine of status updates and presenting and static agendas and whatever, pick literally any of the structures or or make your own structure that says for 10 minutes we're gonna do updates and for 20 minutes we're gonna jam on work in progress and for 10 minutes we're gonna talk about it and then we're gonna do a closing round and don't worry about whether it sucks actually because starting with any structure that has any kind of time boxing and is facilitated in any way and sticking to it will show you what you actually need. And like yeah. the source op rhythm at the ready was such a tough nut to crack and it is still not perfect because that is a group of people that wants to do a lot of different things together and there's a lot of different types of work that span a lot of different altitudes and we don't have very much time together. We basically have like 90 minutes yeah. a week together and it was a really tough nut to crack, but we just did a routine for like a quarter and then at the end of that quarter, we were like, it's not right, but we don't know. So we just did it again for another quarter. And then we were like, it's not right, but we're not sure. And we were like, fuck it. Let it roll till the end of the year. And by the end of the year, we're going to really like figure out what next year is. That's so much better than just living with the thing you know isn't working. It's like we were actively trying a structure. And then ultimately, because we were in a routine imperfect though it was, we realized which muscles were being overdeveloped and which were being, were allowed to be too weak. And then by the time the design for this year, hat tip to Tabia and Sharon for their help with this, was drafted, it was so much smarter and tighter and it's going so much. And now I think it's like 85 or 90% of the way there. But um, yeah. it's because we tried something and stuck with it and then really learned from it. And you can do that in like the most basic way. And it will probably still be better than 90% of what's out there. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um, closing round. No more ideas. Closing round question. Wrap it up, Sam. I'm going to do a different closing round question. Let's okay. do 10% better. What could we do in our next podcast to make it 10% better? 
Love it. Love this closing round question. I think because this is such a huge topic, mm. I wonder if we could have played with a little bit different structure for kind of Ooh. tackling it. Because I found, I think we were bouncing back and forth between like meeting design, structure, the individual experience of meetings, meetings and the role they play in the larger opera them. Yeah. And those are just like three levels that you can kind of talk about meetings. And it probably would have been better organized if we were like a little bit more systematic because I noticed a bit of bouncing. But I don't know. That's that's probably not even 10%. That's like 8%. Mm, that's a really good one though. Uh, it's almost like we know too much about meetings and we need to like <laughs> – tighten the aperture yeah. to be able to do this. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, I think for me, this is a really hard time slot. Yeah. So my 10% better would be like, I am not at my best at 3.30 on Friday after three weeks of travel, turns out. And so I think it was harder for me to be like crisp than it usually is because my brain mm-hmm. is not, my brain could be 10% better. Or more, possibly. <laughs> yeah, I totally hear you uh, on that. And good news is that's why we have Jack. Yay. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> I'm going to have your work cut out for you today. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're always looking for new topics for the show. So if you have an organizational pattern that you're having trouble changing, shoot us a note at podcast at the or if you always want to shoot us a note because you enjoy the show, we won't we say no We love that. it. Same email. Yeah. This show is engineered by Taylor Marvin and produced by our favorite stage mom, Jack Van Amberg. At Work with the Ready is created by the Ready, where we help organizations around the world change the way they work. Thank you for listening.